Hi, and welcome to Axelbank Reports History and Today Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with John Reeves, the author of Soldier of Destiny Slavery, Secession, and the Redemption of Ulysses S. Grant. He's written three books now and was a professor at the college in the Bronx. That's only about a mile from where I grew up, leaving college. Both my parents graduated from there. Uh, Professor Reeves, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Before we start our interview, I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. Even among presidents, Ulysses S. Grant has among the most memorable grave sites. His tomb, Grant's tomb, has a large dome that evokes both the Capitol building and the White House, and it also seems to be a precursor to the Lincoln Memorial, which was built several days after, uh, several decades after Grant's. Somehow, it is in an out of the way area of New York City, right? Not many out of the way areas there, but it feels like uh, Grant's tomb is in one of those places. Um, inside the tomb on the walls, if you look up, there's a mural of Robert E. Lee surrendering to Grant at the end of the Civil War. Nowhere in the image is an image of a black slave or of a black soldier. Somehow the story of Grant's views of slavery has largely been forgotten until now. So, Professor Reeves, why did this crucial part of his story get short shrift? Yeah, so, you know, um, that's one of the things that I take a close look at in, in the book. And essentially, I think scholars are familiar with Grant's connection to slavery, and some give it more emphasis than others. But I think ordinary Americans are not that aware of it. And, and it really gets sort of minimized in the the, the biographies of him. Oftentimes, people point to his freeing of one slave named William Jones as something that he did right before the Civil War. He didn't receive any compensation, and they kind of write it off as, you know, that was his act of defiance. It was an anti-slavery act um, while he was living with his wife down in Missouri, a slave state, um, uh, living on an estate that had about 30 enslaved people working there. And of course, uh, Grant's wife owned four uh, slaves of her own. But here's the thing. Julia, his wife was named Julia. Her slaves were also Grant's slaves, right? So he was benefiting from the labor that they provided. They hired them out um, when they went north to uh, Galena, Illinois, and received uh, compensation for, per year um, for these slaves that were working in Missouri for someone else. So he was constantly benefiting from it, and his connection was a lot deeper. And I think this desire to see him as a sort of an anti-slavery, uh, you know, because of his role in the war, made it made it sort of unpleasant for people to raise this and bring it up in books about him. It's just fascinating to me. He had an anti-slavery father, but he married, as you mentioned, into a slaveholding family. His wife and his father-in-law both involved in it. Um, first, where did Grant grow up and what were the values instilled in him as a young man that would impact his views of slavery later? Yeah, so interesting. His background is fascinating because he grew up in Ohio, um, along the Ohio River. His father... Even though he grew up on the frontier and his father grew up, um, you know, almost abandoned at age 12, he built a, a great business as a, as a tanner and was fairly well to do uh, relative to other people uh, in Ohio at the time. And mo most importantly, his father made it clear that he would not own slaves and, and didn't own and, and was he, his father says, I wasn't an abolitionist per se. But I wasn't pro-slavery either, you know, so he was sort of in between. But Grant grew up in a home that was was more or less opposed to slavery, even if not stridently so. Um, and so, you know, he has that background. He's a northerner. His family's from Connecticut. And um, he, he is not someone who was around uh, slaves growing up. And then, of course, he joins the he, he goes to West Point, joins the army, stationed outside of St. Louis after his stint in West Point, meets a, a young woman named Julia 
Dent, Julia Dent at the time, and her family were slave owners. And so they so, got married and he's involved with it. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, we know that Abraham Lincoln, um, the first time he saw a slave was likely as a young adult when he was um, doing a work trip down to New Orleans. I think he was working for a shipping company, but don't quote me on that. But he mm-hmm. went down to New Orleans in the, on the river um, and he likely saw slaves there for the first time. Do we know when Ulysses Grant first saw a slave or interacted with one, do you believe from your scholarship that it was during that first trip west to um, marry Julia Dent? Oh, it would have been much earlier than that because, you know, so there's a story that I include in my book where um, Jesse Grant, Grant's father, had an older brother who was an abolitionist and actually brought a, a a runaway enslaved woman and her son with them to stay in brother Jesse's house temporarily in the, cause Ohio was a free state at that time. And li- so little Ulysses, I think was probably, you know, uh, five or six at the time would have been, would have not, not only spent time with um, this enslaved woman who lived there temporarily, but also would have known her, child who I think was a couple of years even younger than Ulysses. So that would have been his probably first experience. But I think also, you know, Ohio's right across the river from Kentucky and Kentucky was a slave state. So probably he was more familiar hmm. with enslaved people because I think they went back and forth, obviously. What, across the river. what was the law and the debate over slavery like in the 1850s when a lot of your story takes place, both nationally and in Missouri, where Grant, as you said, moved to live with Julia. Yes. Yeah, so as you know, as a lot of people know, the the, the Union states were the northern states. Um, slavery was illegal and, and they were known as free states. The border states like Missouri um, had slavery and slavery was legal. And in fact, the l- laws in Missouri were quite strict. And often the presumption was you were a slave. So for a freed person, for example, who was in Missouri, they would just assume you were a slave. And the, and the rules surrounding freed people in Missouri were quite harsh because they didn't want you there. And they made it almost so unpleasant. You had to get a bond, for example. Um, you, and if you did any, if you get picked up for any kind of petty crime or, or even larger crime, you would forfeit the bond and could be re-enslaved. And so they were very strict. So basically, I would say during the 1850s, slavery was was still strong in Missouri and the demand for slaves was still very strong. Slaves were being bought and sold in St. Louis. So this, I think that maybe there's a misconception that slavery was sort of slowly fizzling out, but nothing could be further from the truth. And the Dred Scott decision um, is based in St. Louis too. Yeah, and it's and it's in in St. Louis right while Grant is arriving. Uh, the case gets started, and then obviously um, decided by the Supreme Court in 1857. One thing that, um, and by the way, it said that blacks just simply had no rights as American citizens. Um, uh, one thing that struck me about the way you put this together is, you, you know, you ta- start talking about the slaves that the Dent family owns, and you said they have names, um, yeah. often just first names. But I think that's important. Just describe what life would have been like, from what we know in particular, about the Dent slaves. Yeah, so that was a story that I really felt was important to tell because I think that, you know, oftentimes it's, you know, oh, Grant was around these slaves, but it wasn't his thing. But, you know, he was he was living and working and benefiting from this estate. So there were, you know, like I said, there were 30 or so enslaved people, you know, different amounts at given different times. Um, but, you know, there was, I, I go into some detail, there was Mary Robinson, who was the cook, and she had a big responsibility feeding people. There was another one named Mary Henry, and um, Julia Dent, Grant's wife's um, nursemaid, uh, who was also named Julia, and they often referred to her as Jewel. So I tried to give names and 
faces and jobs and roles to these to these enslaved people um, because it was you know a, it was a working community. But obviously, they didn't have any rights or any uh, ability to earn money or to go as they please or do what they want. Describe, if you can, also how Grant rectified in his mind the pre-slavery, the the pro-slavery views that he had with the reality of the fact that he was benefiting from it. What do we know about his correspondence back then and his view of suddenly taking part in this institution that he, for the lack of a better term, I guess, allegedly was against, but once the fruits of it were in front of him, he was willing to accept the benefits. Yeah, you know, during the Civil War, he told one of his patrons, um, a congressman at the time, um, that he was he was neither an abolitionist nor anti-slavery uh, during the 1850s. So, you know, he wasn't opposed to it, and his wife owned them, and they benefited from it. And I think he, he saw it as just an asset that uh, the family had, and it allowed them to kind of make ends meet. And he, he doesn't mention, that's one of the most important things, he doesn't mention any kind of criticisms in his correspondence. He never publicly denounces it um, mm. prior to the Civil War, so how, which is, I think, interesting in and of itself. How important was Grant's time in the West to his evolution as a commander eventually in the thick of the Civil War? Obviously, he goes to California, and as you write, he gets basically thrown out of the military for a brief period because of his drinking so how do you kind of look at this sort of the view of like the Civil War is always north-south, but the West was there too? How do you put that all together in in Grant's story? Yeah, you know, I think the West is an important on so many levels. I'd say most most importantly is he was stationed, he was living in Galena, Illinois, working as a retail clerk in his father's store. And when they're calling up volunteers to join the Union Army, He's the only one in town with any military experience. So obviously, who are they going to look to, to train and to drill and to organize the administration, get people uniforms, these sorts of things. And I think by being out West, given his education at West Point, he was able to kind of gradually rise up through the ranks and take on more and more leadership and responsibilities as the years unfolded, instead of getting thrown into a high command within months of the war breaking out, which would have probably been too much for him to handle at that time. I'm really curious where we find ambition in his character. Um, What seedlings were planted early on that um, even if you took on a job in as sort of a rank and file fashion, you know, even though he was born into sort of a simple life that you could move up, that there was something you can make of yourself that was bigger than the station you were born into. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I tried to do in this book was tell the story by looking at the influence of his father and his wife, right? And both of them lionized Ulysses and and thought of him as as just this incredibly talented person who would someday make something of himself. And I actually think that matters quite a lot because he did have confidence. He did have a belief that someday he would do something great. And, you know, his father adored him and also was proud of his experience in Mexico. So I think, unlike the story of this sort of down and out guy selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis, in fact, he was a guy who had a belief in himself and was a good leader. And once the situation was right, which was he he had these abilities that made him a kind of a natural commander. Um, once the environment was right, then he rose, you know. You've done Lee and Grant in Battle versus One Another as a book. Um, you've done another book on just Robert E. Lee in a court case that he was involved in. How did your career lead you to this particular book? Yeah, so um, my background is I was a history professor for for many years, and then I left academia and began working as an editor in the financial space. So, you know, I edited and and did some writing on my own. And and so I was doing that work, and I said to my, I, I thought to myself, I really want to write a book. 
Um, and um, I had discovered these legal documents related to Robert E. Lee's indictment for treason. And the more I started digging, the more I thought, hey, I've got a book here, you know? And so that's how that came about. So it was sort of a, it was a sort of a, um, a you only live once sort of deal to write the Lee book. And then I loved it so much, I just have kept going since then. How, um, how, how hesitant were you, if at all, to take on a biography of Grant when there have been numerous biographies, of course, um, by storied historians, but even just in the last 20 years, Ronald White, Jean, Ed- Jean Edward Smith, then, of course, Ron Chernow did the super famous one of over a thousand pages. Um, uh, were you at all hesitant to say, hey, I can I can break new ground here? So I probably should have been. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I wasn't, and for this reason, not out of any arrogance or or anything like that. But it's just that I felt that I wanted to tell a story. I don't see myself any longer as an academic. I have an academic training, but I see myself more as a writer. And I was trying to tell a story, and it was something that I just was fascinated by. And I felt like that that period before the war hadn't been done as much because. If you're his biographer, the Civil War and then the two terms of the presidency are so overwhelmingly gigantic as topics that you kind of want to just skate through. Yeah, no kidding, right? And so I wanted to say, what if we were to just pick this off and go a little deeper into it? Do you think that there are still new sources to find of somebody whose life has been plumbed in a way that probably only a few dozen Americans' lives have been plumbed Um and also the fact that he was a president, so much of his stuff is public to begin with. Baking from our childhoods just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware, and there'd always be Bakewell slice, flapjacks, and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Aww. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from the Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Once again, so to your point, is there new stuff to be found? I think there always is, right? There's always new stuff to be found. However, I think that there's a diminishing returns. So, so as you, there's very little to be found, right? And you really the 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 effort to find those remaining scraps would be high. But this is something that I believe quite strongly is there is a mountain of information out there, and I think that. It needs to be mastered and interpreted. And everybody's going to have different ways of doing that. And I think that our brains can only handle so much, right? Like at a certain point, you you are kind of struggling to control the information. And so that's why I kind of, and by the way, that's why there's a million books about Napoleon and, you know, or Churchill or, you know what I mean? There's endless fascination. And yet there's also so much that can be written about. So I guess I feel like there's no there's no end to the what could be written about Grant. I believe that. Um, where is the earliest part of his transformation? What evidence do we start to see, as you put it, in the um, early part of the Civil War that he goes and starts to take this journey from, as you put it, being ambivalent about slavery um, to something that he starts to set as a goal for himself and for his country to get rid of? Yeah, so I think that you probably start seeing it in late 1862, because what you have there is, you know, in the summer after the Battle of Shiloh, um, the Union Army is moving south um, through northern Mississippi. And one of the things that is happening at that time is the enslaved people of Mississippi are liberating themselves, right? And so this is going to eventually be one of the key factors in breaking the back of the Confederacy. But also, what do what are what's the Union Army going to do with all these freed slaves? Number one, and number two, 
how could they be utilized perhaps in the army as soldiers? And I think Grant starts to think, hey, here's a here's an opportunity to defeat the Confederacy by using freed slaves in the armies. But also, I think as it became his responsibility to feed and clothe and house, but also command these men, he saw he saw the issue differently. He starts to uh, we all try to um, interpret the founding fathers and try to examine what exactly would they want today. I mean, it's I think it's largely an impossible question in some ways yeah. to answer, but we all try anyway, and I'm certainly guilty of that. Um, Grant was only about 80 or 90 years or so after the founding. What do we know about how he viewed the founding fathers and what their ideals for America were and what was his opinion on how they jived or not with the existence of slavery? Such a good question. So I would maybe take a step back and think about when he looks at the country. Grant is someone who had an ancestor that came over shortly after the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts. So he has an ancestor going back to 1630s Massachusetts. Um, his family has been here a long time. He is deeply invested in America and the, the Revolutionary War. And um, I feel that that's part of why he never wavered on the Union. And so I think he was someone who had a great faith in this country. And I think that's what separated him from some of the folks that he lived with in Missouri who were slave owners and secessionists. Even though he was living in Missouri, he was deeply committed to the Union and, and never for a moment thought that he wouldn't support uh, the continued of the Republic. You know. For instance, Kennedy loved Thomas Jefferson. Other presidents have cited Madison as being among their favorites. Um, has he ever, um, did he ever write about which founder he most looked up to? Yeah, so I don't think, you know, it's funny, it's like when you, he wasn't someone who wrote a lot about um, historical figures. My hunch is that Washington, as, as like so many of that generation, he was still a, a huge, um, it was a hero um, to a lot of, a, a lot of the um, leaders at that time. So it was probably Washington, but that was not, kind of not his style to kind of talk about. Uh, how did he be? Yeah, how did he become such an intellectual? I mean, somebody who, or at least someone who wrote so much. Um, it's just fascinating to me that he he's leading men in battle and he's truly on the front lines in a lot of different ways and a hard drinking guy, and yet he's capable of sitting down and writing page after page after page. And you describe letter after letter after letter. How did he train himself to write so much? Yeah, you know, I think it was part of just being a commander and I think it was easier for him to communicate with his subordinates by writing it out himself. He had a very clear writing style, very concise. Um, one of the things that I write about in the book that I love is that he always had this ability to tell a good war story. And I think that that, I think sometimes the ability to speak clearly and write clearly are similar. And I think that I also argue that I think that that's what made him a good military leader, right? Because that ability to almost see things clearly in, in, in a simple way and explain them also makes you able to get to the, the heart of the matter and not get bogged down by details. You know? How did his experience leading Black soldiers, commanding Black soldiers, how did that start to impact his view of them as people? Yeah, I think one one of the nice things about Grant is he he could just be very a real straight shooter. He didn't get he didn't let his own biases or his own kind of prejudices get in the way of of an objective situation. So one of the things that he saw was that these African American soldiers were good fighters and they fought bravely and were and and so the more he saw of their success on the battlefield the more he trusted them. And I think that a lot of the Civil War generation and Lincoln was another. I think when you see somebody risk their lives on the battlefield for their country, 
it all of a sudden is a pretty easy jump to, hey, these folks should be citizens with all the rights of citizenship, voting, property ownership, et cetera. You know? So you write about the redemption of Ulysses Grant. Um, what exactly is the redemption of Ulysses Grant? What do you describe in your book and 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 how does he reach this point um, where he finally says, this is a country worth fighting for because we all have to be equal, at least in some respect? Well, you know, what's funny is that redemption had two meanings. Um, and I originally set out, I was, I was really set out to understand his remarkable turnaround, going from being forced out of the army because of alcohol abuse in 1854 to rising to the very top of his profession in 1864 as the lieutenant general. So by redemption there is like, how could someone who would, who had gone so low rise to so so high and 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 in some ways that was you know he was almost he also overcame that sort of humiliation and i think if it wasn't humiliating to ulysses it was to his father um jesse had a really hard time when he got forced out of the army so there was the redemption there was that redemption arc in the book right but then there's also yeah he goes from a slave, someone who was involved with slavery and benefited from slavery to being arguably the single most important individual in ending that institution. What did the Dents think of his redemption? Yeah, so the the the, the father, who is just an incredible character, Frederick Dent, who gave himself the title Colonel, even though he wasn't a colonel. Um, well, I'm, I'm Mr. President, so there you go, right? And you know what's funny about <laughs> Colonel Dent is, and he was he was such a he was sort of a rascal, right? Because he was a pro-South, pro-slavery, like just sort of this unreconstructed rebel. And then at the same time, he kind of liked it when his son-in-law started to rise in the world um, with the money that came with. One of the things that I was sort of struck by um, when, while writing this book is that, you know. These promotions that Grant got during the war came with a pretty good salary and benefits too. So he went from mm. earning eight hundred dollars a year as a clerk at his father's store in Galena to making ten thousand dollars a year in eighteen sixty four as a lieutenant general, plus all of the benefits, the freebies that come with that, you know, pension, etc. So you can imagine his father in law is like sort of like on the one hand doesn't like that his son's fighting for the union. On the other hand, hey, he's making a pretty good buck, you know, because he was he's not, not going to want my inheritance uh, anymore. Yeah. And so uh, one additional thing I'll say is this might be one of those tall tales, but a, a local in uh, outside of St. Louis said that Colonel Dent once at a time told Ulysses, if I ever see you here with any of your troops, I'll take a shot at you, you know, so. You know, he probably didn't say that, but was <laughs> he okay with the end of? I mean, how'd they react to the end of slavery? Yeah, so not okay with it. I think, <laughs> um, I think all of a sudden, one of the things with Colonel Dent, which makes complicated a complicated story, is that he was in debt, right? And so he was also facing because of the chaos at the time. It never happened, but he was facing the possibility of having both his his land and his slaves being sold off to pay his creditors. So things weren't going great for him, but he, he did say at one point um, towards, um, it, towards the end of the war, he was trying to go vote and there was an African-American there and he got, and uh, Colonel Dent got in a huff that, you know, people were trying to check his, his uh, ID and his papers and that sort of thing. And so you could see he's, He's not, he's not a particularly, uh, he's not a warm guy and he definitely had pretty, um, pretty atrocious views even for them as far as slavery goes. How did Grant view Lincoln? I'm really curious to hear what he thought about the Emancipation Proclamation. And also as the war wraps up, um, you know, Lincoln makes it clear that we've got to have the 13th Amendment and all these other things. What did Grant think about these steps and how did he view Lincoln as a leader? Yeah, so I think that he I think that he admired Lincoln and he and he had a good working relationship with him. 
And I think that um, he saw Lincoln's strengths as a politician and probably recognized that that maybe wasn't at that time his own strength. One of the interesting stories in 1864 was is that Lincoln was fearful that Grant might run for the presidency mm. in 1864. And even they had a mutual friend called Russ Jones, who I write a bit about. And Russ Jones went to see Lincoln to assure him that no, Grant doesn't have that desire, but kind of on almost a wink, wink, especially if you were to make him Lieutenant General, he would definitely not want to run in front of the presidency. Right, right. Which they, of course, then did make him Lieutenant General. So, but but I think that uh, Grant only, you know, towards the end of my book, Grant meets Lincoln only for the first time right. in March 1864, but they obviously knew each other through correspondence and, and uh, Lincoln saw him as his man and I think Grant happily um, served him um, and saw him as a, a benefactor. That reminds me of when those uh, crooked guys in New York tried to keep Teddy Roosevelt, get Teddy Roosevelt out of New York. So they made him vice president. And before they yeah. knew it, he was president. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious also how you believe Grant's um, metamorphosis on slavery and his newfound uh, insistence that America had to hold itself to certain values, how that led to his desire during his presidency to truly heroically go against the Klan and use federal law to at least try to enforce some semblance of civil rights and to go to root out these evil Klansmen that were making it impossible for Black people to vote in the South. Yeah, and I think that that's part of... And I think those stories are connected, right? As the as the lieutenant general who defeated the South, the notion that the, these folks could just defy the law and almost re, almost return to a, a pre Civil War environment just was something that he couldn't he couldn't abide by. And you know, and I think that natural commander. Uh, role that you know he 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 was a natural military leader you know and so that came that came to him as saying you know this can't stand and we're going to put it down um, and instead of the sometimes the other parts of being president of of negotiation and compromise and forming agreements would have come less easy to him than than something like that. I'm not sure if you're ready for quite a question like this, but what, let's just let's just ask it because I think it is relevant. Um, what would he say about January 6th and a president who has been indicted for inciting insurrection, running for president again, and watching the attempt to overturn an election that you know a federal law enforcement believes a former president tried to do? So, not to get too political, but I think we have some we have some. Um, evidence, right? So he's a real firm believer in the union, number one. Number two, the republic and and norms. And he does, so he's, you know, remember one of the things that made Grant join the army, rejoin the army was when the South seceded in 1861. And he said to his brother, I guess I'm going to be joining the army, aren't I? You know? yeah. and so he, he took this kind of thing serious. So he would have been very opposed to January 6th, number one. Number two, at that time, like a lot of West Point officers, kind of anti-politician. So he definitely saw politi all politicians as as corrupt and, and demagogues and that sort of thing. So he even spoke, he, you know, he saw, I think he said something to the effect that Jefferson Davis should have been locked up from day one, right? So, so the way he viewed these things was that, that that sort of thing would have been unacceptable. Not getting into the politics, because you know, Grant was kind of a conservative guy in 1861 on most issues, but not when it came to the Constitution and the Republic. What can we take away from the story of Grant, from fence sitter to someone who actively fought for what I guess counted as civil rights back in the 1860s? What can we take away as we watch today's battles? over racial justice. Again, from a, seeing a guy like Grant go from fence sitter to, to more than a foot soldier, a leader in enforcing civil rights. 
Yeah, so I would say there's one real obvious lesson is that um, maintaining the union in the 1860s required participation, right? Meaning he had to um, he had to fight to preserve the union and he had been educated at his country's expense at West Point. And so he saw it as an obligation, not just to something I'm gonna do, but he even said to his father, hey, they, I, I received my education, now I have a debt to pay uh, to my country. And also I think he saw, he saw the union also in economic terms too, that you know the West was a great land of future opportunity and if we're divided, we all can't take advantage of that, of those resources and those opportunities in California or, or uh, you know, the, the new territories, which, by the way, raises a whole other issue, right, about Native Americans, whatever. But he saw it as one country with all the opportunities that that provided. If you, well, I'm sure you've been to Grant's tomb a number of times, and I have to say it is a wonderful place to reflect on Grant or other things. It's a quiet place. It's a beautiful structure. And I think it's just a lovely place to visit in New York City. Uh, my wife and I went uh, about a year and a half ago, and we just really were in awe of seeing the beautiful dome and the murals inside and some of the artifacts. And then, of course, the caskets that look like they're encased in some kind of sheen and marble and everything. It, it just It's beautiful. If you could design a new mural... Uh, which I reflected on uh, in the beginning of the show, uh, if you could design a new mural that would go on Grant's tomb or in Grant's tomb, that would be a tribute to his views on slavery. Is there a certain scene that you would depict in that mural? Gosh, that's such a good question. And I think probably um, something from his Vic the Vicksburg campaign, which I think was so crucial to, to, not only helping win the Civil War, but also it was pivotal in ensuring um, that the enslaved people remained free because in Mississippi, by that point, it was all over. So I think that, um, meaning there, there, so many had liberated themselves. So thinking of maybe the, the surrender, uh, receiving the surrender of the city of Vicksburg seems like a, a almost a, a turning point in the war. And a lot of folks believe that that may have been the, the most decisive moment of the war. And of course, it was on the 4th of July too, which is- uh, an Yeah, amazing. that's cool, right? That's cool. A lot of weird stuff seems to happen on on July 4th. Yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, how would you introduce Grant to today's young people? And I'm talking about young people. I remember in nursery school, hearing about Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, right? Three, four, five years old, you start to hear these names. How would you introduce Grant to those kids? What do they need to know? Yeah, I think I would maybe, um, I would I would probably emphasize that story of redemption, right? That here was a guy who had met with some um, setbacks as a young person. He, you know, when in um, 1854, when he's forced out of the army, you know, he's, He's thirty. He's thirty. You know, he's uh, he, he's not a young man at that time, and and so um, I would emphasize that sometimes you have setbacks, and yet you can also uh, turn things around and go on. Maybe not to become president, or maybe not to become <laughs> lieutenant general, but to achieve what you hope to achieve. So I think I would maybe emphasize some of those 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 challenging years during the 1850s what was the coolest artifact you got to see in person during your research if any maybe you did it all online i'm curious if you got oh, to yeah, see no, a handwritten no, no. letter I, or I, something I, I did do some um i would say for me the coolest thing was is i went to the shiloh battlefield and i just am fascinated by the battlefield uh, the battle of shiloh and um of course grant there has that famous scene where um, Sherman comes up to him and it's raining after the first day and and Sherman says, you know, he was going to say, I think we should retreat, but something said uh, he shouldn't. And he said, oh, you know, heck of a, heck of a day, devil's own day, isn't it? 
And then Grant's smoking a cigar. Lick him tomorrow, though. And I, I saw the place where he was standing, right? Wow. Um, and in fact, the tree that he was supposedly at has has been was struck down by lightning. So they've got this sort of um, object, I, for lack of a better term, yeah. it's kind of a it's kind of a pole, right? Like um, as a sort of a signifier of where he his headquarters were that evening. Um, anyway, to me that was really meaningful and powerful and and just being at the battlefield of Shil at Shiloh was was a, a great experience for me you and i have a great connection which i learned about when i started reading your bio and preparing for this episode and that is that you taught at Lehman College in the Bronx the a, a school that i've known since i was a tiny little boy i played baseball at Harris Field right across the street from Lehman College i'm just curious what your uh, my parents graduated from there, by the way, both my mom and my dad. I'm just curious what your memories are of Lehman College and how much you've seen that campus and the Bronx change around it. You know, I loved, I loved it. I loved my students there, and 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 they were, they were different than a lot of college students. A lot of them were immigrants. A lot of them were really hardworking. We, we would. I taught Western Civ at the time, so a, a kind of a different topic to what I do now. Um, and um, I just felt like what a great American experience, right? Because these kids were all, most of my students were the first students in their family to ever go to college. Mm. Um, and um, and so, yeah, I, I had fond memories there. It wasn't easy, you know, it was, it was, the teaching was both rewarding, but also harder in a way too, because a lot of the students weren't as prepared as say other schools, you know. So. Did, did you, uh, did you drive in or take the four train? Oh, I took the train in. Yeah. yeah. I was living in Manhattan at the time. Uh, on the, my wife and I, live, we weren't married at the time, but yeah. we were living on the Upper East Side of uh, Manhattan. The dedication in your book, I love asking about the dedications to my father, John William Reeves. Why? What did you think was appropriate about dedicating this particular book to him? Yeah. So, oh my gosh, it, it, it the book reminded me so much because in many respects, one of the big themes in the book is the relationship between Jesse uh, Root Grant and his son Ulysses, right? And that I think Jesse has been portrayed by historians as kind of this... Um, sort of a, a character, you know, sort of a, a, a almost a, a unserious character. But I found him to be a, 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 an extremely accomplished person who had an enormous influence on his son. And so I, I think that it made me think of my own father. My father, like Jesse, was sort of that, like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps um you know what I mean? Like it's just he—he he had to go to night school and yeah. um, things were tough. But he, you know, so it—it it, it really resonated with me, and and I—I I had a connection there. I'm not sure if you have any idea. I'm curious, what's next for you? Do you think you'll do another Grant Lee Civil War era book, or will you do something else, or nothing at all? Yeah, so definitely have another book in mind. I'm doing research on it um, at the moment, and so. Yeah, I'm happy to share with it. Why not? Um, I've been sort of interested in um, not late 19th century corruption. And, um, you know, I used to be a financial writer. so um, But I'm interested in corruption and I'm interested in um, the the Grant administration. So there's a, there's the uh, there was the whiskey ring in St. Louis, but there was also, and this is something I've been really gravitating towards, there was a lot of corruption out west in the Native American territories, and which ultimately led to even the larger uh, process of dispossessing uh, these groups from their land. You know, so anyway, the, the, there's so much there. It's a very rich time. But I, the, one of the things that I'm attracted to it too is that, you know, with the end of the Civil War, there's so much promise, right? And yet. Um, there's also those years weren't as um, harmonious and as, you know, maybe perhaps as they weren't what they could have been um, in the 1870s. John Reeves, the author of Soldier of Destiny, Slavery, Secession, and the Redemption of Ulysses S. Grant. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Check out the book. Check out his website, john-reeves.com. 
He's on the website formerly known as Twitter at ReevesJW. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axelbank Reports, History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axelbank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. See you next time. Thanks.